Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much indeed for taking the time to join in this discussion this evening. It's a real delight that so many schools have decided to join in. It's wonderful to have the opportunity of sharing perspectives, as we shall this evening, on three very important words and ideas. The city, for a start, trust, and this rather complicated and difficult word, spirituality. But I'm going to mess around with the order of words a little. I'm going to start by talking about the city. Then I want to say a little bit about what I think spirituality is and isn't, and move on from there to talk about trust, and hope that it still makes sense. So let's start with cities. Why do we have cities? Why didn't people just stay where they were comfortable? In smallish communities, where if you had anything you needed, there was some identifiable person around the corner who could look after it for you. You need bread, there's somebody around the corner who bakes. You need a nail for your horse's shoe, there's somebody around the corner who does that sort of thing. That's quite a comfortable world, where on the whole, the people around you, the people you will meet, are going to be people quite like you, and it's going to be a community where it's quite hard for people to go unnoticed or to be forgotten. If you're in a small community, you do notice when people are not around. But the economic life of societies gets more complicated as time goes on. People not only want to go around the corner for a loaf of bread, they might want to send to the next village for a cake. And gradually, as people trade more, invent more things, exchange more things, and quite simply travel further to look after their desires and their wants, new sorts of people appear, entrepreneurs of one sort or another, who manage the flow of trade, and they need places to settle and have their outlets. Bigger societies begin to appear. Market towns, first of all. You bring your produce to the town and sell it to people you don't know, not just people around the corner. And market towns begin to grow into cities. One of the most interesting moments in European history is somewhere around the 9th, 10th century, where you begin to see a number of settlements in Western Europe being given licenses, often by the local Christian bishop, to hold a market. You look at that moment and you think, that's the beginning of the end. That's where the process of economic and social development really takes off and you're on the road to cities. Well, the point of this um, extremely amateur introduction in terms of economic and social history is to remind us that the city is always a place of diversity. Or to put it even more simply, the city is always a place where you're going to be alongside people you don't know and people who are not necessarily like you. The city is a community that's not defined by kinship, by family, by neighbourhood, in the simple way that a village might be. And that's why cities need a lot of imagination to make them work. Because in a city, it's quite easy to reduce your relationships with some other people just to economics. And in a city, it can be fatally easy for people to slip off the radar, for people to disappear, to be forgotten, not to be noticed. 
one of the basic narrative models, you might say, of modern society is the person who goes to the city expecting to find independence and freedom of action. And what they discover is isolation and being ignored. Cities are diverse. In a city, you're always going to be alongside people you don't know very well, you're not related to, with whom you have only limited natural relationships. So if cities are going to work at all, if they're not just going to be the kind of thing that far too many cities are, a sort of desert of impersonal encounters and forgotten and vulnerable people, we need something that will give us a basis for respecting one another, independent of our kinship, our family relations. We need a vision of human dignity to keep cities going. Smaller and simpler societies can get along on the basis of kinship, of being a bit like people or related to people. Larger, more complex human communities need something a little bit more robust. They need a vision of the grounds for respecting one another. And that, I think, is where our discussion this evening really begins. Either the city is a real project, a real challenge for our moral energy and imagination, or it's desert and chaos. A desert and a chaos which sometimes breaks down into little pseudo-villages, people clustering together in the midst of a really rather wild and windswept landscape. If you look at some of the cities of the developing world, in Latin America or in Africa, you will see that phenomenon. Communities of very vulnerable people huddling together alongside massively prosperous areas where trade goes on regardless. I dare say you don't have to go too far down the road in a city like this one to see something of that, but that's another story. But it does mean that faith in the context of cities is going to be a bit different from faith in the context of smaller and apparently simpler communities. Urban faith religious practice and belief in the context of the city is something which, at its best, can be part of that process of providing a vision on which respect is based in a complex and very diverse environment. For cities to work, they need people to make a decision to belong together a decision to belong together. And they also need intelligence in identifying the common challenges and the common needs of a community. For a city to work, we need the intelligence to notice who's being forgotten, to notice the needs that are not being attended to, we need the intelligence to see that the interest of the whole community is bigger than that of any group, and certainly bigger than any group composed of people who are just like us. And if my initial analysis is right, the essence of the city is that it's absolutely full of people who are not like us, whoever us is. So that's a bit of a sketch of what cities are like and what kind of impact they have on human beings and the human imagination. And that suggests to me, beginning to move into this realm of spirituality, that suggests to me that the first spiritual imperative is realism. Realism recognize what this community is like. 
In a city, you simply have to get used to the fact that not everybody is like you. You have to get used to the fact that you will see and hear strange things around you. And sometimes very strange people. That you live in this context of diversity and you mustn't try and deny it. One of the saddest things that people can do is to deny the reality of difference and variety around them and say, with a little bit of effort, we can pretend that actually we only have to deal with people who are like us after all. Other people are there and you have to work with them today. Not tomorrow or the day after, but today. I think this is actually a very important dimension of being spiritual. That realistic perspective which says, today, here and now, you start to live well. You don't put it off and you don't deny the complexity of the challenge that meets you today. Every morning in morning prayer in my church tradition, we say the words, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. The spiritual life begins by saying, actually, it's here and now where we begin. And although there will probably be rather different views in this church tonight about who exactly the devil is and what he gets up to, one thing I can guarantee that the devil always loves to do is to make us deny reality. Because the devil is, we Christians say, the father of lies, the devil is always at work in trying to persuade us not to see what's in front of our own noses. As I say, however exactly you understand the devil, that power in the universe always trying to make us ignore reality, that's one of the most powerful and poisonous things we can experience. And there's a lot of it around. Our spiritual health begins when we're realistic and we don't take refuge in the fantasy worlds that the powers of evil try to put in front of us. God is always bringing us back to here and now. And if here and now is an urban community full of diverse experience, diverse culture, diverse hopes, that's where we begin. Respect for the reality in which God has placed us and diverse reality. The task which God sets before us is not to reduce all that diversity to uniformity. God doesn't say, first of all, get everybody to be like you and then you can start doing my will. If that happened, the will of God would take a very, very long time to get done. God doesn't say, wait until lots of people agree with you and then you can start doing what matters. God says, here and now, you begin the task of responding to actual human needs and actual human hopes. Not the fantasy, but the reality. And that's why I say that the first step in spirituality is realism. That in turn means that the second step in spirituality is patience. Because if the world is like that, if God is asking us to cope with the fact of difference and variety around us, well, we need patience. It would be simpler if everyone were like us, simpler if we were back in the village, so to speak. And there are many ways in which we can pretend that, but it won't do because God wants us to live in reality, not fantasy. 
But now this word spirituality, it's quite a complicated one really, and it's quite a modern one. You didn't hear very much of it until about 50 or 60 years ago really, and it seems to have dug itself in in the last few decades as a word which means something like this. Religious belief is a little bit difficult and not very attractive, but we'd quite like the warm feelings that go with religious belief. So we'll call that spirituality. And we'll think of ways of providing ourselves with warm feelings that go with belief without actually having to have the beliefs. I'm being a bit unkind, but I think that can be one of the dangers of talking about spirituality. And when people talk about spiritual values, some of my antennae begin, begin to twitch, and I wonder exactly what's being said here. I want to be a bit more robust about spirituality. I want to say that the spiritual life is not some corner of our human existence where we look after our warm feelings. Our spiritual life is the quality of integrity, passion, prayerful devotion that shapes everything we are and everything we do. The spirit, if you like, is all round the body. The spirit is in some little corner inside the body. The spirit is bigger than the body. So spirituality, instead of being some little internal area, spirituality is living out, outwards towards that shaping, energizing force, which we believe as people of faith comes from God. It's living to our fullest capacity of love and intelligence. That's spirituality. That's the life of the spirit. And if we lose sight of that, then our faith becomes, I would say, sentimental and private and perhaps rather selfish. But I want to talk for a few minutes about how that comes into focus, particularly in my own tradition as a Christian. I want to look briefly at some of the things that the word spirit has meant in Christian talk. There'll be parallels in other faiths, but I'm here as a Christian, and so this is one perspective on it. In Christian scripture, the Spirit of God is about at least two very important things. One is clarifying. Jesus talks at his last meal with his friends about the Spirit of Truth, which he's going to send to them. The Spirit of Truth, who will show you everything. The Spirit clarifies, uncovers, makes the world clear. The Spirit will show us unwelcome truth about ourselves. The Spirit will show us how we assess and discern the way the world goes. And we're led into all truth. The Spirit clarifies. And the second thing that the Spirit of God does in Christian scripture, is connect. Again, Christian scripture talks about the communion of the Holy Spirit, the togetherness of the Holy Spirit. And when in our scriptures, St. Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit, he talks about qualities of life which have to do with connectedness with respect for one another, with all those things that bind us in common life and common work. So in our scripture, the word spirit is about what makes things clearer and what shows us how we're connected with one another as well as with God. And life in the Spirit 
life in accordance with God's spirit is going to be a life involved in those two things. Again, the phrase comes up in our scriptures that the spirit works with our spirit. Our spirit, the energy of our life, the shaping energy of our life that comes from God, has to be brought into harmony with the spirit of God, the outpouring of God's own life. So when we as spiritual beings receive the spirit of God, we can expect those two things to be going on. Clarifying, connecting. And perhaps in that light, you can see why I don't want to say that spirituality is about cultivating feelings. It's about clarifying what we see and understanding how we are connected. Let's think for a moment about the clarifying bit. I said a few minutes ago that one of the things that the powers of evil like to do is to prevent us from seeing what's in front of our noses. And so naturally, by contrast, one of the things that the Spirit of God loves to do is to show us what's in front of our noses, to open our eyes to what we may see every day without noticing it. Life in the Spirit is a life in which we notice. One of the most poignant, powerful stories that Jesus tells in the Gospel is the story of the rich man with the poor man at his gate. And the picture is of someone who, day by day, simply doesn't notice what's in front of him. If that rich man in the story had been living in the spirit, he would have seen. His vision would have been clarified and purified. He would have seen what or who was there in front of him. And so he would have known that other kind of clarifying that goes on in our lives when something becomes clear about the will of God for us. We notice someone in need or distress and our duty becomes clear. The word, the invitation of God becomes clear. And in Christian language we often speak of God calling out to us from those in need. God in the face of the lost or the suffering, actually calling, summoning us. When you meet the eye of someone in suffering or poverty, you actually find the courage to look them in the face. It's the call of God, even the face of God, you can say, drawing you out. And the other thing about clarifying, of course, is that as the Spirit makes things clearer, the Spirit begins to nudge out of the way all those ways in which our self-interest, our laziness, our selfishness, stops us seeing. But I actually think that one of the basic questions we want to ask ourselves, if we'd like to be spiritual, is... What does my selfishness stop me seeing? What does my selfishness stop me seeing? How much am I pretending? So when the life of the spirit begins to make things clear to us, when the spirit of truth in Christian terms is at work, we're being invited to go beyond the self-assertion of an individual or a group into something new, into new kinds of connection, new kinds of solidarity, as people like to say. Solidarity and connection, even with people who are very, very unlike us. Clear away the selfishness, clear away the anxiety that goes with selfishness. I don't want to be bothered with what's out there, I know what's good for me. Clear that away. 
And then you have the freedom to understand that the person, the persons around you are not from another planet. You understand that even with those who seem very different, there is some kind of solidarity. And the spirit creates connection. The spirit of truth helps you clear away the, the obstacles to seeing. The spirit of togetherness, communion, draws you into solidarity. So, if we were to move on from there, to think about trust, I think perhaps we might see how all of this spiritual reflection in life begins to open up for us the possibility of a life lived in trust rather than in fear. The basis of trusting someone else isn't necessarily that we like them or we agree with them, not even that we empathize with them in some way. The basis of trust is some kind of recognition that the other person's presence and the other person's needs are real. And because God has put me in front of that reality, it requires work, patience, service, to build something together because we trust that we belong together. However different we are, however diverse our needs and our backgrounds, we're given the strength to trust that we belong together. That therefore, in some sense, what's good for me and people like me is bound up with what's good for you and people like you, or them and people like them. And so, Trust begins, I think, in a confidence that the human world can belong together, that human needs and human concerns can converge instead of pulling apart all the time. And as we recognize the basis for that kind of trust, then we also learn to trust one another in the work that goes towards it. Once again, in Christian tradition, we talk, and we find the language in Christian scripture, we talk about interdependence, not just connection, but really depending on each other. So that again, St. Paul can say, if any one part of the body, the community, suffers, everybody suffers. If one part is fulfilled, that has implications for everyone. So my wealth, comfort, prosperity is there so that you will have wealth, comfort and prosperity. And your poverty, your need, is my problem and my poverty. We depend on one another. We don't become fully human without each other. And for me that's very near the heart of what Christian teaching affirms. And again, there are other ways of approaching that in other traditions. But that for me is where the real energy, the real vision of Christian service comes from. That's part of what makes trust possible. We mistrust one another most often, don't we? because we suspect that somebody else wants to be well off at my expense. We mistrust somebody else when we think that for them to succeed must mean for me to fail. We live at the moment in a society where there's a huge amount of mistrust, because a lot of people near the bottom of society don't believe that those on top of society have their interests at heart and they're not entirely wrong about that. We live in a culture where it's very easy for people to think it's a zero-sum game, one person's success is another person's failure. 
And so we are a very mistrustful society. We think that somebody is always after what belongs to us, that sharing makes us weaker. A trustful society is one in which we believe that sharing makes us stronger. And I've tried to give you some reasons for believing that that is a profoundly religious perspective on society. And maybe that is one of the simplest things we can say in the society we now live in. It's so easy to think sharing makes us weaker. Faith tells us sharing makes us stronger. Because it takes us further towards that world in which we are all involved with one another, depending on one another, at each other's service. And when we trust that there is a common destiny and calling for human beings, then we can trust the other the stranger, the person who's different, more easily. So, um, why doesn't this happen? The short answer, of course, is that this is very hard work. Urban life is risky. And we all of us like our comfort zones. And we all of us like to be with people who are like us. And we all of us secretly believe that the world would be fine if it were full of people like us. Other people's agendas often look threatening to us. And let's be honest, sometimes they are threatening to us. Let me be personal for a moment, because it struck me as both tragic and comic, this little experience I'm going to relate. Um, I was actually in New York on September the 11th in 2001 and I was about two blocks away from the World Trade Center when the planes hit it and the experience of that day, the terror and chaos of those few streets around the World Trade Center on 9-11 I won't forget very easily. A little later, I wrote about the experience that I and my friends had shared that day. And one of the things I wrote was, it's very easy if somebody comes at us violently to think that the most effective response is another kind of violence. And that's what we've got to get beyond. But I had an email from somebody in the United States who said, you must be crazy. What you don't realize is that these people want to kill you. And I thought, well, you know, actually, I noticed that on September the 11th. <laughs> but it seemed to me one of those deeply ironic examples of how people can fail to, to see something. Of course, life is dangerous. Of course there are people who may genuinely be threatened, threatening. The question is, what do you do when you feel threatened? Do you close up? Do you lash out? Or do you try and go deeper into yourself and find the resources that will enable you, in the very long term, to build the kinds of relations and the kinds of connections that will make it just a little bit less likely that this world will be scarred by horrific violence like that. That takes time. It's not quick, it's not simple. And that's why we don't see a whole lot of it a lot of the time. But I think that religious communities of all kinds are called in our world perhaps as never before to witness together to alternatives to division and violence. And in any urban community, where as I've said, there is always going to be anxiety and there's always going to be diversity and there's always going to be discomfort. In an urban environment, it's all the more important that we should be seen witnessing together 
to the alternatives to division, prejudice, and violence. As I said, we are in a position to say, sharing makes you stronger, not weaker. We are in a position to say, everyone deserves profound, costly respect. And we're in a position to ask, who is being forgotten? Who is being brushed out of the picture? Whose concerns, whose voices are being ignored? We can do that because we believe in a divine agency which clears our minds and brings our connections to light. Remember, clarifying, connecting, those two central words. And if we have any justification for our presence in a society like ours, for what we do in our cities and our communities, if there's any justification for religious people being around, if there's any justification for expecting that people might sometimes want to listen to religious people, it's because of this. We all know how very easily this society thinks that religion is the problem. It's very much up to us to show that it's part of the solution. And that again is a fundamental thing here. People think religion is part of the problem because often people see religious communities behaving in what I call a villagey way. They want to be with the people like them. They don't want to be compromised or soiled by the people who are not like them. And they're so concerned with policing their own territory that their eyes are closed to the needs of others, closed to what's actually in front of their eyes. And when people say that about religious communities, it is a terrible reproach. Imagine, on the Day of Judgment, God says, so why didn't you actually notice the person dying on your doorstep, or for that matter, the person dying on a doorstep in Sudan or the Central African Republic, wherever it may be? Why didn't you notice that? And we say, well, actually, we were too busy keeping ourselves pure and strict and apart from people who are not like us. We were too busy policing our territory. I don't think the Almighty is going to be very impressed. So, how do we show that we are not the problem? But, let's be ambitious. God's answer. We show it by being truly spiritual people. That is, people who are all the time seeking for God to clarify their minds and hearts. If we're people praying daily for clear vision, make me honest is one of the most important prayers we can pray. Make me honest about myself, make me honest about the world. Don't let me be led, we pray this daily of course as Christians, don't let me be led into temptation. The temptation of thinking there is an escape from the diverse, the complex, the different. Don't let me be led into the fantasy world of the devil. And we pray also for our eyes to be opened to our connectedness. So that when we encounter another human being, our thought, our sensation is, here is someone whose destiny is bound up with mine. And in the long term, I'm not going to be human without them. That's such a, an ambitious and sometimes such an unlikely thing to say. I'm not going to be human without them. We look around and walk down Piccadilly after this lecture when you're recovering from the onslaught. Walk down Piccadilly and think, that person, that person, that person, 
I'm not going to be fully human without them in some great, mysterious, unimaginable future. Because we're all involved with one another in growing up in our humanity. So, really, we have two very demanding, very simple tasks as people of faith trying to live trustfully and spiritually in the city. Our first task is simply witness, bearing witness to that spirit of clarity and connectedness, reminding ourselves and one another that that is where transformation comes. And the second thing is to be active, as active as we can be, on behalf of those who are not seen and who feel disconnected. All those who feel nobody is listening, nobody is looking. All those who feel the connections have been cut. Nobody has a stake in my well-being. And you meet such people in so many contexts, people who are convinced that they are not seen and not heard. A few years ago, the Children's Society had a very effective poster campaign in this country, which showed an obviously rather disturbed teenager, and the slogan alongside was, what I need is a good listening to. So often, of course, we say, what you need is a good talking to. And here was this young person saying, what I need is a good listening to. All around us, there are people who could say that. People saying to us, what I need is to be seen, and seen whole, and seen respectfully. And as we witness to this dual job of clarifying and connecting, we need to be pushing all the time at that second great imperative, to see, to connect those isolated, those who feel unseen, unloved, and un yes, uninvolved in the life of their society. So to sum up, trust and spirituality in the city. Trust is about that confidence that human beings really do belong together. A big act of trust, a very risky thing to believe. It's not obvious, and sometimes it feels easier not to believe it. But if we have that confidence, then we can be begin to build trust in one another. And spirituality is the root of that trust. A spiritual life which is about clarifying and connecting, allowing Almighty God to take away the distortions and blockages that our selfishness creates in seeing one another, and bring to light our connections. And we are to do this in the city, in that diverse, complicated world we inhabit, where we're surrounded by people who are not like us and who don't always make us feel comfortable. Remember what I said early on, for a city to work, we need commitment and imagination, a vision of human dignity. We can't take it for granted. We need all the time to be working to deepen that and consolidate it and reinforce it. I believe that the resource and the potential for all that is enormous. And that for especially younger people of faith in our society, that kind of vision is a compelling and a vivid one. I hope that that's part of what's brought you here tonight, and that in the discussion period that follows, you'll be able to share something of your own passion about all this, and your questions, your explorations, some of those areas where we need to grow and develop and consolidate this further. So thank you very much for listening patiently.